Okay, here we are, hour number two already. Webster Tarpley joins us this hour, America's greatest living historian, in my view, a uh, friend of this program and yours for many, many years now. Here we are, and Webster, three years to go. People were asking what Obama was going to do, a lame duck. Was he going to get divorced? Was he going to sit around the the old ballroom and watch the big screen TV? Basketball, round ball, football, doesn't matter. What's he going to do? Well, he told us a couple of weeks ago last Monday that he was going to use his pen and his phone and to hell with the Congress. Not a, a big yeah, surprise. No, but, uh, no. Tell, tell us what... what te- yes, That's the was. Republican uh, caricature. Okay, right? I heard, That's what the I, reactionaries are doing. Now, I heard, I heard him say it, but I wanted you to tell me what he was saying when he said that. He said, I'm basically not going to be... Uh, stalled and held back by legislation and waiting on same from the Congress. He said, quote, I've got a pen and I've got a phone. And then he went sure. on from there to make it clear that he was going the, to use the, executive orders. Now, does this, bother, question, does this bother us or not? No. The question is the quality of the executive orders. Executive orders to do what? If it's executive orders for the idiot chimera of global warming, and imposing austerity for the polar bears, the pelicans, and the... Uh, well, the polar the, bears uh, are already dying of radiation, so I, let's take well, them off the list. Not, we have to worry about humans, right? The, the subjects of, of politics are human beings, and, of course, then the environment for humans. That's also that's also true. But um, Okay, so that, I just wanted to not, get that on the table. Look, I'm, you're putting yourself in a, in a, in a re- relatively vulnerable position because we have the greatest saboteurs that we've ever seen, right? The, the reactionary Republicans and their fascist faction, the Tea Party, have mm-hmm. successfully blocked all government. And you've now reached the point of rule by decree, which they have, in effect, imposed. Okay, let, now, me get this, let me get the... Hold on, hold on, let me get this straight. I, I haven't put myself in any position. Asking questions does not okay. compromise anyone. Yeah. However, but, what you just said was very interesting. You're suggesting, in your view, and I'm sure you could back it up, that the reactionary Republican lunatics have forced him to make this, well, it's called a proclamation. I'm going there to are, rule There by are decree. points when the business of government has to get done. Now, let's, let's, uh, let's, first a couple of things about the current Go situation, ahead. right? There's nothing, it, it, nothing to bring forward the most sardonic laughter than the saboteurs of the state, right? The, the anarchists, the, uh, Oh, the yeah. bankruptors of the state right. coming forward and saying, now, how dare you take emergency measures after we've successfully tied the, uh, the whole thing up in knots? Now, it is a serious question. Um, the point in the Weimar Republic where rule by decree started, very interesting, it's March 1930, which is the fall of the Hermann Miller social democratic-led government. Uh-huh. And it fell over something very similar to the leading issue today, extended unemployment benefits oh. and how to pay really? for extended unemployment benefits. How, I, it is uncanny, yeah. uncanny. Yeah. Uh, as Marx writes somewhere, he says, they don't know it, but they do it. <laughs> and uh, like Marx, I don't like him that much. But fact is, these characters of today are, they seem to be, uh, forced to repeat all the mistakes, even though some of them have actually studied the mistakes. We'll That's get a to very Yellen interesting overlay in a minute. So, the Hermann Miller government, we reached March of 1930, and the big uh, banks in Berlin and the big uh, industrialists of the Ruhr and Silesia were saying, "Okay, now we've got to cut the employer contribution to unemployment benefits. We got to make other workers pay for that." So the, the tax on all workers goes up to pay for the unemployment benefits of the unemployed. And at that point, the Social Democrats said no. Hermann Miller of the SPD, Social Democrats, his government fell. And from that point until Hitler's seizure of power, just about three years later, slightly less than three years, but almost three years later, mm-hmm. there was no majority. Mm-hmm. And anything that got done got done by a decree. And the main practitioner of the decrees was Brüning, right? Heinrich Brüning or Brüning. And these were the so-called Notverordnungen, emergency decrees. That's what it means. 
And these were austerity decrees, deflationary mm -hmm. austerity decrees. So those were very, very bad austerity decrees. Now, when Obama comes forward and says, I'm going to do an executive order which raises the uh, wage rate, imposes a minimum wage on future federal contracts, this is a trifling matter, but this is well within the prerogatives of a president. And anybody who screams at that is nuts. It does mean they're just showing how naive, how ignorant, how, you know, how they're being led around by... Well, by, they may not be nuts. They're just not as well, informed as you are. Well, it's this is you know this is the world of Frank Lunds and Karl Rove right at this point right Repub Republican <laughs> sloganeering, but it is a serious question. Now it's also very interesting that Italy entered the the uh, area of rule by decree at just about the same time as the United States in the past mm -hmm. couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. What we had last week in Rome was a decree law, which was another bad one. It, the, the Italian system has the decree law built in. And it's much more common. It's been much more common because of the instability of the post-war Italian governments. But they had a decree going which essentially said uh, the uh, real estate tax, the tax people pay on their homes, is postponed. And about 8 or $10 billion are transferred from the Bank of Italy to the private banks. So it was a, it was a bad decree. Okay. But at that point when... The uh, Speaker of the Italian House, the Chamber of Deputies, the woman called Boldrini, and she's also quite bad. She's a raving uh, ideologue. She said, all right, now we're going to vote on this. The Beppe Grillo Party, which is in many ways a, a fascist or Pujadist party. I can't go into what that all means, but think of them as sort of fascism light. Those guys <laughs> caused a riot in the Italian Chamber of Deputies. They stormed. The the, uh, the seats where the government usually sits in the front, and uh, some women were punched, and this was the greatest riot in the history of the of the Italian Parliament since 1944. But what happened then was that this woman Boldrini, the speaker, said, "Okay, I'm using the so-called guillotine provision. I'm cutting off debate. I'm starting the vote, and I'm ending the vote, and it passed." So. Italy has entered a, an, an acute, extreme form of rule by decree. Now, here we are with rule by decree in the United States, somewhat, right? Because the yeah. remember the yeah. Emancipation Proclamation was a an executive order. Okay, one of the greatest things ever done. So the question is the quality of the executive order. Now, again, if Obama says I'm coming out here and I'm going to impose a tax on greenhouse gases he's on he's on his road to uh to to collapse right he'll he'll be out of there fairly soon mm -hmm. however let's think of some some decrees some executive orders again that would make would make sense one would be to lou right secretary of the treasury lou executive order to you you will obey the 14th amendment section four you will pay the public debt of the united states no matter what happens the debt ceiling is unconstitutional, and national bankruptcy is illegal. So you're going to pay. And it means that whatever happens with the debt ceiling, you will continue to run treasury auctions, bring in the money, and we're going to have business as usual. We're not going under, and you Republican fascists, you can like it or lump it. And this would have, this would have tremendous support. Then we could, think of, um, we could think of some other things, right? We're operating in, under a wartime situation, right? People forget it. We're at war. There's a war going on in Afghanistan, and, and legally speaking, we're operating under that, that infamous uh, resolution to use military force from uh, September 2001, the one that Ron Paul voted for before he turned against it, yep. right? Just, just yep, to, re yep, yep. to recall. Yep. So we're in an, we're a state of emergency, and the Republicans were the ones who, who brought it on. Fine. What you could do now is say, oh, extended unemployment. Well, uh, I'm the president. The Congress is paralyzed. Under the Defense Production Act, and you, people should take a look at the Defense Production Act, it's a beauty. The president can do just about anything. It's all in the Defense Production Act. Uh, Obama could say, I wish he would say, um, we've got to maintain our labor force. We can't have... Our valuable workers starving or, you know, dying or, mm -hmm. you know, being homeless and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I am going to impose.
the indefinite prolongation of extended unemployment benefit. Those are the kinds of executive orders that make sense and would be supported by 70, well, 80, 90 percent you, of the American absolutely. people. So it's all Talk the question, about, executive new, orders for what? Right. A, a new populism, if he were to do that. Executive sure. orders for what? And we will find out uh, fairly soon. We'll find out. Hold on a minute. Be right back with Mr. T as we continue. Okay, Webster Tarpley and I and all of you good people, uh, let's carry on, Webster. Jeff, I'll give you another executive order that I would love to see. Okay. This is now the Federal Reserve. Okay, we know that the Federal Reserve operates in an area of absolute illegality, total totally. anarchy. Totally. Because what happens is that helicopter Ben Bernanke, or his now successor, since we're now in the first week of the Yellen era, mm -hmm. Yellen gets a phone call from Jamie Dimon or Lloyd Blankfein, right, of J.P. Morgan or <laughs> yeah. Goldman Sachs, whatever it is, and they tell her what they want. They say, we need this, this, and this. It's really and that helicopter simple, ben, That's not a joke either. He helicopter said, Ben yeah. opened these credit facilities. He said, you want term auction facility, TAF, TALF, primary dealer credit facility, money market credit facility, credit facilities for AIG, Maiden Lane, a whole list. Now, it would be possible to do this by phone call, but you, if, you know, to keep the the uh, keep up appearances, this could be an executive order. The president issues an executive order. It goes to Yellen, and it says, "Given my powers as president under the Defense Production Act, given the war emergency, the 9/11 emergency, and we have a bunch of emergencies, right? It's hard to keep track, but we have at least uh, one, and we probably have two or three." He could say. We need an economic recovery. We haven't had one. Your policies have failed. Therefore, what you will now do is to open the following windows. Uh -huh. We want $5 trillion made available to states and authorities for bonds. The bonds are 0% 100-year bonds to build all kinds of infrastructure. Governors should come forward. Any governor who's got a meaningful infrastructure project shovel-ready, come mm -hmm. forward. Now, in the, in the Obama stimulus, there was about $200 billion of this. It was good, but it was not enough. It was a drop in the bucket. Mm. Let's get $5 trillion, right? The Federal Reserve can generate any amount of credit. Why do we need to borrow money from China? Mm. We can generate it ourselves. We've just seen the entire world credit system depends on loans from the Federal Reserve, right? Barclays Bank, Societe Generale, Deutsche Bank, Unicredito of Italy, all of these have depended on loans directly from the U.S. Federal Reserve. So $5 trillion for infrastructure, right? We want to build superhighways, modern rail, high-speed, maglev. We want to build modern electricity grids. Well, I'm, I'm, listen, I'm all for what you've been saying for years on this program. This We've is got the point, to turn <laughs> toward ourselves and rebuild the infrastructure. That's yeah, but where the can, money you know, needs you can to also go. Do this. this can also be done for the Export-Import Bank. The Export-Import Bank goes into high gear with this stuff because they could get 0% credit, too. But um, the other thing, the, the other obvious thing is with the whole younger generation being crushed by student loans, why not at least refinance uh, all of that into 0%? It, I, I why should they pay more. it? Let's right? invest in our future. Come on. That could, that could be done through the Federal Reserve. You could have a, an executive order with three or four of these points yeah. that would create a recovery. Now, of course. The fascist Republicans would scream, oh, how dare you interfere with the wonderful independence of our wonderful central bank, which allows Lloyd Blankfein and Jamie Dimon to make the phone call and panned it to bandit when he was there at Citibank. They could call Helicopter Ben and tell him what they wanted. He would do it. How dare you interfere with that system? Where do you think the American people would, would, would uh, come down when they could see Tens of thousands of new jobs per week, right? Fifty, a hundred thousand new jobs per week as this tremendous juggernaut of production began to take off. They wouldn't care about the, the niceties of whether it's an independent central bank. They'd say, look, if the independent central bank is what got us into the depression, let's nationalize it. Let's seize it. Let's deprivatize it, right? Let's put it immediately under executive orders. That's executive orders is much better than than getting phone calls from uh, from Lloyd Blankfein of Goldman Sachs. So those are the executive orders. You see what I'm getting at? 
The I system is, is blocked, yeah, right? Yeah, it's blocked. Yeah, 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 yeah. But life has to go on. I can't sit here and die because Boehner has to, you know, uh, cater to his fascist Tea Party right wing and therefore block everything. No, it's crazy. Another thing you could do, um, it, I mean, it just goes on and on, right? You could, you can, uh, for example, say executive order. Any bank that took TARP money, Treasury money, or Federal Reserve money has to stop foreclosures on all on primary residences. Right? No more foreclosures. If you took federal money, you got to stop foreclosing. That should have been built into the uh, into the TARP. Oh, I agree. But under Bush and uh, under yeah. Paulson and so forth, uh, it, it didn't get done. So I, I don't care about you know executive orders. Why should why should you care about that? George Washington had executive orders, and again, oh. one of the greatest things in American history is the Emancipation Proclamation. Orders, it's an executive order. Okay, but they weren't called executive orders back then. Sure, they were. Executive order—that was the well, exact name of it. No, well, no. Th th these are no. these are. Um, I think I don't know. That would be an interesting question. When when did the actual term executive orders come yeah. in? But these were, in effect, what we would call today executive okay, orders. Okay, uh, it, it really is up to the man. Uh, okay, if we have a man with credibility, honor, integrity, we got nothing to worry about. There are people out there who are concerned, and I'm not a reactionary Republican. You know me very well. Uh, <laughs> but this this is a this is an avenue open to potential abuse. Yeah, of Let's course. Let's leave it at that. Of course. So uh, again, today nothing works without a mass movement, right? You want to keep keep anybody honest, doesn't matter who. You better have oh, a my. mass movement sure. that they dare not cross. So, uh, but you see, the, the whole point is the people, you know, the libertarians, right, the, I, don't, I would say, the dupes of finance capital, <laughs> mm -hmm. they're out there screaming along with the Republicans in mm -hmm. one chorus of idiots. Um, that takes you out of the picture. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're, you're, you're not, if that's the only thing you can say is, you know, we, we don't like executive orders. You're out of it, and you oh, don't have way, anything to offer the American people. Did you see? You think story? Joe Sixpack cares whether he gets a job through an executive order right. or through something that's gone through the Congress and been approved by Joe Boehner? Wow! Have you uh, have you noticed that story that Romney allegedly admitted that the there was some chicanery involved to take the momentum and the nomination away from Ron Paul? Did you see that story? <laughs> Come I thought on. you'd laugh. No, no, Look, I did You should read my book. I wrote a book about this called Just Too Weird, Bishop Romney and the Mormon Takeover I told you, I commended you on the title. I thought it was one of the great and titles. In that book, I, I explain in some detail how Ron Paul was an integral part of the Romney campaign. Well, we talked about it here. He was the right wing. He was the right bumper, the right wingman of Romney, meaning that any challenge, such as Santorum, which is what happened, yeah. Any challenge emerging from the right of Romney would be crippled uh -huh. by the presence of Ron Paul. On the other wing was Huntsman, who was the left bumper. And, for example, suppose our dear friend Chris Christie, right, the Garden State no. girl, if he, had, if he had tried to throw his hat in the ring, mm -hmm. they would have channeled more money to Huntsman mm -hmm. to protect, to protect uh, Romney from that flank. Oh, interesting. But this is what people have to understand. Ron Paul was a shill for Romney. And the, the idea was, if his votes were needed, then the price would have been little Rand on the ticket as vice president. We that's talked about the whole that, damn thing. A swindle yeah. for this yeah. rotten, yeah. ghastly family, the Paul Tards. Well, no fan of uh, little Rand here. Hang on. Be back in just a minute with Webster, and we will talk about more. Stay tuned. Okay, and here we are back. Lots on the table. All right, onward, and let's see where we go next. Why don't we talk about the European Parliament elections? Right? This oh, is something that right. people probably haven't heard about from other Something other that sources. Uh, the average um, uh, Britain is uh, very interested in, I'm sure. Wow, there we, there we have this monstrous UK Independence uh, Party, which is, is a, uh, a racist, uh, xenophobic uh, party. And remember that that when you had you had some little riots going on in some yeah, yeah, slum yeah, there in yeah, London, yeah. that guy Farage and his gang called for martial law in the entire United Kingdom, martial law, all over. Yes. So that's not that's not exactly libertarian, but that's no, the, exactly yeah. that's what Br you Br Brussels is uh, pretty well declared uh, 
him persona non grata under any circumstances. I don't, I don't they, care what don't, they do with him. I they don't like him. him. No. Well, he and Rand Paul could get together, right? Look, it, it is true, yes. Rand Paul is obviously a racist who has had to, he had to kick two people out of his office in the last uh, 18 or 24 months for being white supremacists. And the, the latter of the two was the so-called um, Confederate Avenger or Southern Avenger. I mean, these are Lincoln haters. They're glorifiers of the lost cause. This is, uh, this is a blind alley uh, here in the United States or anywhere else. But now, the, the European election, what you've probably heard about them, about that, is that the, uh, the racist parties are going to clean up, and, and they may. Uh, but that, you know, we probably can't do much about that. The question is, what else happens? Now, what I mean by this is, in France, you have this thing called the National Front with Marine Le Pen. Now, this is the daughter of this elderly politician now, Le Pen. And Le Pen, of course, comes right out of the Vichy fascist regime of Marshal Pétain, right? Typical French fascist uh, background. Yeah. She is now, uh, she's the vehicle, she's going to be the beneficiary of a large protest vote. It doesn't mean, whatever happens, it doesn't mean that French people really believe in the racist and xenophobic and anti-foreigner and indeed anti-worker recipes of Marine Le Pen. But she has now also, she's got this alliance going with this guy, Wilders, Gert Wilders of the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And this is the guy who became famous around the yeah. Theo van Gogh uh, murder, right? Well, this van yes, Gogh was yes. the Descendant of Vincent oh. van Gogh, right? The artist who cut right. his ear off. You've right. seen him, Kirk Douglas, right? But this character was, in effect, a provocateur. And then some intelligence agency sent in an assassin to complete this dumb show, right? This was all fake. I mean, the guy really died, but it was a, a complete fake in the sense of the goal there was to well, take was one a, of the most tolerant populations in Europe, murder. the Dutch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, political murder. Uh, to take the Dutch population, famous for their tolerance, right, going back mm -hmm. to the the 17th century, right, the wars of religion and so forth, they were they were some of the most moderate when when they got the chance. Um, this was uh, so the the idea was that to take that body of anti foreigner opinion from the Netherlands, put that together with the French, you can add in the Italian uh, Northern League. You can add in the Austrian uh, Freedom Party. You can add in some others. So the the big headline from the European elections is likely to be that racist, xenophobic, and anti-Europe, anti-Europe and anti-Euro parties are going to get a big success because they're the most obvious vehicles for a protest vote, and their message is easily understandable by backward, ignorant Voters. Okay, fine. So that's that's going to be the big story. But now, the subtext is what interests me. And here we have to look um, with a certain granularity, because this is not stuff that you can find easily. But in Greece, and I think we've talked about this before, right, when it happened about yeah. 18 months ago, yeah, yeah, we yeah. have the Syriza, S-Y-R-I-Z-A, the left block. And this is something that was stitched together very patiently with very good methods from about a dozen different groups, groupuscules, parties, partylets, whatever we can call them. And this, but this is now the number one political force in Greece. The Syriza group, in terms of polling, all the polls indicate that if a, a general legislative, you know, political election, general election, were held in Greece, this Syriza group would win. They would kick out... Really? The, yeah. Huh. The polls show that this is now the majority. It's, it's, you know, it's about 35% or 30 to 35%. And in Greece, you get a bonus for coming in first. Italy, right. same thing, at right. least uh, at right. the moment, right. and, and, and likely to be so in the future. So uh, this is this guy, Alexis Tsipras. And I would point to him as the most important figure who's going to come out of this election, because this other stuff is all old hat, done to death. Marine Le Pen hates foreigners, fine. 
Gert Wilder is of the Netherlands, hates foreigners, he's an mm -hmm. Islamophobe. All right, we get it. <laughs> but this Alexis Tsipras, this guy, I just saw his, uh, his speech at the uh, conference of the U European uh, Left Party, right? It, it, which is, it's not just a Greek party. This is all over Europe, right? They have about 5% of the vote. That's fine. With 5%, you can do a lot. And his, they, they ask him, what are you running on? And he says, we're against austerity. We fight austerity. We will not tolerate austerity. And we fight the economic doctrine of neoliberalism. Now, neoliberalism, in case you haven't noticed, is what Obama represents, right? Obama, say, with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, right? The free trade Wait, uh, uh, All right. Now you've opened the door to that. What, what are your thoughts on TPP? I'm absolutely against it. I hope uh, so. Remember, the American, I represent the American system. It's a glorious tradition. It's what made the country. The American system has three elements. The first is a national bank. Hamilton's first bank of the United States. Henry Clay's second bank of sure. the United States. Daniel Webster's attempted third well, bank, which never flew. Where is it when we need it? Second point is infrastructure everywhere. Third point, a protective tariff. I'm for a protective tariff of 15%. That today would be a protective tariff. So we no to, to the Trans-Pacific yeah, well, Partnership, no to the fast track. And even Harry Reid has got the message, right? Harry Reid says he's against it. He's against yeah, the Yeah, he's running, he's running scared. He's That's scared. fine. Let him run. Let him run. Yeah. Watch him run. <laughs> okay. Yeah, let's watch Harry Reid run. Back in a minute with Webster. Hold on. Okay. Uh, Webster's going to uh, put together one of those office pool boards pretty soon, which you can participate in on the month that Rand Paul will announce that he is running for the White House. Ho-hum, we're all yawning. Um, well, this is a guy, he comes out with a straight face and says he's against extended unemployment benefits because that, that's going to corrupt you. He warns you against the terrible corrupting power of an unemployment check. At the same time, and this maybe leads us to another interesting topic, um, he's got this, this thing that he brought forward as his response to the State of the Union. Right now, every dirty speculator in the United States has thrown a lot of hot money into foreign speculative markets. But unfortunately, as always happens, those foreign speculative markets are now undergoing a process of contagion and meltdown. Right? South Africa, Turkey in trouble. Argentina, a special case Argentina, has a good economic policy compared to many others, better at least. But they're under attack because they're independent. They don't take orders from the imperialists in the way that Turkey or, or others uh, would do. So uh, what Rand Paul is proposing right now, when a lot of speculative parasites and predators want to bring home a lot of money, mm -hmm. Rand Paul comes forward and says, let's give them a tax holiday. Let's take a nominal 5% off the hot money they bring back and we'll encourage them, and then they'll create jobs. No, they won't create jobs. They'll buy derivatives. Oh, they'll sure speculate. They they'll do what they always do. Yep. So this guy is absolutely despicable. He's the despicable son of a, of a despicable uh, father. And to come out and say with a straight face that for those 1.9 million families that need unemployment checks, and anybody who's ever been on unemployment, and if that's the only income of the family, you know how dramatic that is. It's a, it's a family tragedy. It's an absolutely unacceptable, barbaric situation. He comes forward with the, with the worst Wall Street line, right? Typical libertarian, right? What they always have been ever since David Rockefeller brought von Hayek and von Mises to the United States, right? These ideologues of, uh, of exploitation and, and uh, ripoff and and whatever. So it's it's timely. But now the, mm -hmm. the thing behind this, right? Um, okay. We've got this, uh, you know, stock market in in turmoil now. This is this this allows us to relate to Yellen. Now you know, Jeff, I'm a candidate for head of the Federal Reserve. Still, maybe Good. you've seen my 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 uh, campaign on uh, Twitter in particular. Topley for Fed head. I like the sound. You of haven't it. seen it. I don't do Twitter. This, uh, that's a terrible mistake. You're cutting yourself out of half of the world. Twitter oh, is now 
the the forum of world public opinion. It really is. It is. Really? Right. Yeah, it is. Right. And it right. it took it took me about five minutes to register. See, I can Fed, do it. You Fedhead is it. clever because it sounds like Deadhead and it has a certain resonance with Grateful Dead fans. That's good. Fed well, head, that's dead not head. what I'm looking for, but you know, if, if we okay. can get some You'll hand the, raise, take the support. We'll take it. Yeah. So it's it's tarply the number four Fed head. Now this started when it wasn't clear whether it would be Larry Summers or Yellen. Uh huh. So we put forward tarply four Fed head. You can All right. you can go to this. Look look on Twitter under tarply four Fed head. You'll find it, and please retweet all of those things if you get a chance, and that that that's for the listeners especially. But now. We got we've got the Bernanke era ended last Friday at midnight, and ever since Saturday we're under the Yellen era. Now, what is Yellen? I think Yellen is pretty much an empty vessel. She gets um, think... ideas. She, <laughs> she was getting ideas from helicopter Ben. Yeah, think. Yeah, and then she was getting ideas from her husband, right? Who is also a, a, a an ideologue of uh, uh-huh. of economics. But, but so she is now ensconced, right? She has been passed by the Senate. She, the, we're now in the Yellen era. Can she we is say the person rub, who did, rubber stamp Yellen. Mm-hmm. She designed the QE three. In other words, it's a support operation for derivatives. Mm-hmm. This is the irony that the the Federal Reserve has bought up about three trillion dollars of bankrupt, toxic, kited derivatives, things that should should not even be legal. But they bought them, and they they paid real money for those three trillion of of derivatives. If you had opened one of these credit facilities, suppose you had opened a credit facility with the equivalent three to four trillion dollars, let's say, mm-hmm. and said, "Governors, come forward, give us your bonds, zero percent, one hundred year bonds. You want to build the Texas T bone. You want to build that fast rail in." In, uh, in in California, down the Central Valley. Going nowhere. Right? No, yeah. no. Every railroad is a railroad to nowhere. That's ridiculous. The Transcontinental Railroad was a railroad to nowhere until you built it, and then it became a railroad to somewhere, right? When, when the Transcontinental Railroad would start, people say, Omaha, Denver, there's mm-hmm. nothing there. Mm-hmm. Salt Lake City, well, it's all empty. I, you, yeah, you've driven up, the railroad, uh, have you civilization ever driven, arrives. Webster, have you driven I-5 up to the uh, San Joaquin Valley? I probably it's, have. Uh, it's like, well, but, you'd know if you had. It's like driving the moon, okay? There's nothing there. Yeah, look, the other problem, that, that, that's another problem, is that under Theodore Roosevelt and his lunatic conservationism, a lot of development in the western states was stopped okay let's not let's not kid ourselves and once you get into the the era of total wall street domination they don't allow any of this to happen but now since we're under yellen yellen designed qe3 and qe3 is essentially this hot money policy and it doesn't work and we're seeing now that all of that hot money that was sent out that is what created the boom in brazil that's what created the boom in turkey Ironically, because people were saying, oh, the U.S. is collapsing, and Brazil and Turkey, these are the, the, the countries of the future. Well, to some extent they are, but it was also, a lot of it was a, a speculative bubble created by Federal Reserve hot money. But now that the Federal Reserve is tapering, i.e. bringing some of, you know, some of these uh, purchases are being reduced, if the Wall Street zombie bankers can't count on $85 billion per month of derivatives being bought up. That creates this giant sucking sound, which is what we're now seeing. The hot money is flowing back from these foreign speculative markets into, I think, primarily U.S. Treasury bonds. Interest rates are going down there. Maybe into U.S. real estate we'll soon see. But uh, this is now a crisis, right? And every Friday, watch out, right, as the Wall Street insiders are telling us, every Friday there's a great fear that some country is going to devalue over the mm-hmm. weekend, right? Will yeah, it be Turkey? Yeah. No, Last true. week it was Hungary. Hungary was about to devalue the foreign. Now, it does, didn't happen. Does that matter? Yeah, it does. Because, look, if you go back to the Asian contagion of 98, 99, you'll see that that was all based on things like, the Thai bot. And you'd say, wow, who cares about the Thai bot? Well, 
uh, that's just the Asian contagion, which uh, which pitched the entire world into a into a recession. But now today, with derivatives, that would have created a depression. So uh, Yellen has struck out before she even started. Ironically, just as Yellen arrives at the chairmanship, the toxic fruits of her failing stewardship from the previous years, when she was vice chairman, vice chair, as she wants to be called, uh, this is now coming home to roost. Now, the the next step, uh, Jeff, and you're going to be very concerned about this, is this guy Stanley Fisher, right? You followed this. Oh, yeah. Stanley Fisher of Rhodesia, the former head of the Israeli Central Bank. He's from Citibank. He's from MIT. Uh, above all, he's from the Bilderberger Group. This is the, the center of the argument for me is Bilderberg. Yeah. A Bilderberg agent with a, his connection to the United States is tenuous in the extreme. I wonder what conceivable well, compassion he, could he, he have right. for working people, you know, in okay, the burned you, out industrial are you, not, are you not leaving out a portion of his resume? He is a dual citizen. He had yeah, ranking. Yeah, sure. He, he he's had a ranking. dual citizen. He, yeah, but he, he had he ranking. Was the, he the head of the Israeli Central That's Bank. Right. Okay, let's not forget that. No, uh, I didn't forget it. That was the first thing I said. The Israeli, born in Rhodesia, head of the Israeli Central Bank. But I'm telling you, Bilderberg, 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 because that's the operative mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. This is this is impossible. So if you don't want Stanley Fisher, Tarpley for Fed head, or in this case, Tarpley for Fed vice head, but it's close enough. Well, if you don't make no it, you, I suggest you start out and let's run for Congress and at least get you in the door. No, no, no. Let's do it this way. Because uh, obviously, once you once you're running for Congress, you're under the realm of the Federal Elections Commission. But in the sense of running for the Federal Reserve, that's uh, who you know, who Jeff who all right, who 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 votes? That's appointment by Congress, correct? It's appointed. He's he's proposed by the president and then voted for the, by the yeah. Congress. Yeah. You've also got there are two other candidates that have been named by Barkey at the same time, right? And yeah. and one of them is this person I call her brain dead. That's her, uh, it's brain art, I think. She's also a, a uh, brainer, dialogue of usury and so forth. And then there's one other. So any of those three seats on the Federal Reserve Board could be me. And here's what I would propose. Oh, Once you again, would, it would be a joy. All five of trillion dollars for infrastructure, one trillion for the refinancing of student loans. So everybody goes down to zero. Good. And a series of other, other measures. Now, Concretely, the possibilities of doing that have something to do with the European election. I want to mm -hmm. close on that. Oh, I hear you. This guy, Alexis Tsipras, he's done something similar, I must say. Alexis Tsipras, although he's got more behind him, he's got a candidacy going to be head of the European Commission. Now, you know who that is today? That's this guy, Barroso. Barroso is a Portuguese fascist. He comes from the oh, another, Salazar party. Another nugget. Remember that uh, that Portugal went under fascism in in 1926, and then stayed there until well for half a century until 1975. Remember the Portuguese Revolution uh, of 1975. Well, Cyprus wants to take over from Barroso, uh, and I I would say to people if you want to have something good happen in 2014, it is a year of mass strike. That's a lot of lot of what's going on. Uh, it's important to get Barroso out and Cyprus in. Cyprus, by the way, is going to Rome this Friday, day after tomorrow. He's going to be in Rome. He's organizing a European-wide campaign. That means that he's understood the most fundamental thing. You want to become head of the European Commission, you got to organize Europe-wide, which most of the people in Europe just don't get. So uh, Cyprus for European Commission, head. And totally for Fedhead. Well, we like that. That's very good. Good luck. Thank you, my friend. <laughs> Talk to you next month. See you soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Night.